Tonight's lecture is entitled, Changing the Word. And this is quite a serious topic and people get very excited about it. Because everybody has a favorite Bible. The one says the NIV is the greatest Bible that he could possibly have read. The other one has another one. The other one has the New King James. Somebody likes the Old King James. Which one is the right Bible? Now personally, I came into a knowledge of the Word of God using the NIV Bible. And I found God in the NIV and through the NIV. And that is fine. But as you grow in your Christian experience, you might want to find out the differences that exist in the world and for that you need doctrine. And in the Bible it says that the Bible is good for reproof and for doctrine. And uh, Timothy tells us that we should take heed of the doctrine. So doctrine is important that we may know what the Word of God exactly tells us. When it comes to the finer nuances, if you do not have doctrine and you cannot tell the differences, well then everything can be the same. And basically what you have then is an ecumenical Bible. Changing the words. Revelation 22 verse 18 says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in the book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of the prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now we discussed this yesterday and this is a serious matter to mess and meddle with the word of God. I thought, you know, I'll give you a little resume, a few books that are generally available to the public that are Good to read as far as this is concerned. Our authorized Bible, Vindicated by Wilkinson, is quite a good little book. It's quite old already. It came out in 1930 and it's being reprinted. Which Bible Can We Trust by Les Garrett is a very good book to read in regard to this. New Age Bible Versions by Dr. Ripplinger is also full of information. So there are a number of books that one can get that can help us along the way to find out which version is the one that we should trust. Verses affected in the Bibles, a rough count would give us the New American Standard Bible, 909 verses, that's a lot. The Revised Version, 788 verses. The New World Translation, 767. The NIV, 695. The Good News Bible, 614. The Amplified, 484. The Douay, which is the Jesuit Bible, has fewer changes than the New American Standard. In fact, less than half. Amazing. And the Reformation, of course, rejected this completely, but they're quite happy to accept these ones. Very strange. The old Jehovah's Witness Bible only had 120 verses affected. And when that came out, there was a huge hue and cry over the massive changes that they made. And today, nobody realizes that they're sitting with 909 verses affected, which makes the 120 look like a kindergarten. The New King James Version ignored the Textus Receptus 1,200 times. Now, I quite like the New King James Version, and I, I use it for myself, but I have it marked everywhere where it irritates me. For example, everywhere where the Bible says where Jesus is the Son, the New King James prefers to put servant. That puts a totally different spin on the ball. The word Lord is removed 66 times at least, and so on and so forth. But uh, I'm more interested tonight in concentrating on these where the changes are really blatant. And uh, there are steps from bad to worse, as we can see. Jehovah's Witness Bible is the first one that was changed. Now this was early in the 1900s when, when Westcott and Hort had produced their documents. 
They didn't have their own Bible because up to the 1900s there was no other version except the Jesuit one, which had been rejected totally by the Reformation. So, let's just see what they did. We're just going to run through it. Imagine you are all getting a Bible in your hands, a King James Version Bible, and you're given a black pen and you're told, cross out. This is what they would have done. That's exactly what happened in the early Jehovah's Witness Church because that's the only Bible they had before they printed their own. And then they started changing it. Matthew 16, verse 3, for example. If we go from there onwards, you'll see they removed that one, irrespective of what that text means. I'll show you later in the others that everything that was changed in the Jehovah's Witness Bible has also been changed in the other Bibles, or at least discredited in the margin, if nothing else. So they took uh, Matthew 16, verse 3 out. When it came to the book of Mark, they took verse 46 out. They had to cross it out. When it came to Mark 16, verses 9 to 20, well, they just took out the whole chapter. Because why? Because here Jesus appears physically after the resurrection, and that is a problem. You see, the esoteric world teaches that there is no physical resurrection, it is esoteric. And a physical Jesus having raised, been raised from the dead is a problem. So, take out the chapter and modify the chapters other than Mark that are not quite as blatant on the issue. So if you have one of the modern translations, it will at least say in the margin that this is not found in the oldest manuscripts. But as we saw, the oldest manuscripts were already corrupt because they had the modifications of Oregon, as we will see. John 1 verse 1 in the New World Translation, that's the, the, the Bible of the Jehovah's Witnesses as they have written it. It says there, in the beginning... The Word was, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Whereas the King James says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So obviously, Jesus was God in the King James, but uh, he was a lesser being, if you like, with a lowercase g, when it comes to the uh, New World Translation. Then when it comes to John chapter 1, 11, uh, chapter 8, 11, up to verse 11, the whole series just gone. Just take a pen, ladies and gentlemen, cross it out. We no, need it no longer. We have found something better. Acts 8 verse 37 in the Jehovah's Witness Bible is of course removed because there Jesus is the only way to be saved. Away with that text. You'll find it missing in the others as well. 1 John 5 verse 7 is a major problem because there here Jesus is part of the Godhood. Gone. We'll come to that in the others as well. So that's what Jehovah's Witnesses did. They just took their pens and they crossed out all these relevant verses and whole portions of chapters and whole chapters. And there was a huge hue and cry about it. Now imagine that the Bibles that we have today do more than that, and nobody complains. Isn't that strange? Isn't that strange how we have changed? Dublin Review, 1881. By the sole authority of textual criticism, not in other words by the word itself, not what it says, but by textual criticism, these men have dared to vote away some 40 verses of the inspired word. This was early. Now, as you see, hundreds of verses are affected. The eunuch's baptismal profession of faith is gone, and the angel of the pool of Bethesda has vanished, but the angel of the agony remains. Till the next revision, the heavenly witnesses have departed, and no marginal note mourns their loss. The last twelve verses of St. Mark are detached from the rest of the gospel, as if ready for removal as soon as Dean Bergen dies. Remember I quoted a lot from Dean Bergen yesterday? When he goes, they said, well, they're going to change a lot more. And they surely have. The account of the woman taken in adultery is placed in brackets, awaiting excision. Many other passengers have a mark set against them in the margin to show that, like forest trees, 
they are shortly destined for the critic's axe. Who can tell when the destruction will cease? That was in 1881, when they just started revising the Bible. Isn't that incredible? Well, let's see what the modern people say. This is what modern Bible societies say, Novum Testamentum Grecae, the German Bible Society, Stuttgart, what has that got to say? It says, when Eberhard Nestle in 1898 presented the first edition of Novum Testamentum Grecae, he had achieved a work of which the consequences were not only unknown to him at the time, but also to the Württemberg Bible Society that made the edition possible. If the Textus Receptus at that time still had a number of defenders, the science, note that, the science of the 19th century had however finally proved it to be the worst text of the New Testament. So the Bible, the Textus Receptus that had stood the test of time until 1900, now suddenly was the worst text available. There, the editions of Tischendorf, that's the man who discovered that piece of rubbish in a waste paper basket on which all the modern Bibles are based since 1841, finalized edition of such and such and such and such, and Westcott and Hort came in 1881, controlled the field. But in practical terms, at the level of the university, church, school, the edition of the Textus Receptus was still largely used internationally as, for example, by the British Bible Society until 1904. Irrespective of the changes, the British didn't change that easily. Only with the release of the Nestle text, and did the rule of the Textus Receptus come to an end here also? Much rejoicing in Roman Catholic circles that finally managed to destroy the Textus Receptus. The Encyclopedia Britannica tells us something about Oregon. We'll see in a moment. The received text, the Textus Receptus, is the old Byzantine text with hundreds of copies in agreement. It was written in Coin Greek, note that, written in Coin Greek, of which hundreds of words cannot be translated into Classical Greek. The early church used Coin Greek manuscripts and rejected the Alexandrian versions, which were based on the corrupt versions, which Oregon and other Gnostic revisions. Now, the Encyclopedia Britannica tells us that Oregon taught that Jesus was a created being who did not have eternal existence as God. So that's the basis. If you want to have an ecumenical Bible, you have to remove Jesus Christ as the sole Savior and as God. It has to be done. So I thought we would go to Morals and Dogma, which is, of course, the Freemason source. This doctrine of transmigration of souls, in other words, reincarnation, that you come again and again and again, obtained, as Porphyry informs us, amongst the Persians and the Magi, the magicians, if you like. Herodotus believed this, the Egyptians believed this, the Kurds believed it, the Chinese believed it, and so Oregon held this doctrine. There you have it. All these esoteric ideas, Oregon had them, and Bishop, Bishop Synesius, the latter of whom had been initiated, and who thus prayed to God, O Father, grant that my soul reunited to the light may not be plunged again into the defilement of earth, reincarnation in other words. So the Gnostics held, they held this belief, just like the Hindus do today, and even the disciples of Christ inquired if the man who was born blind was not so punished for some sin that he had committed before his birth. Now that's typical how Freemasons distort the word. Did the disciples inquire that? Well, let's ask them. John 9 verse 2, and his disciple asked him saying, Master, who did sin? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Not this man in this life or in his previous life, right? Or his parents. So, you know, everything is a distortion. You cannot trust anything these people say. Well, he knows who the esoterics are. 
And I said that the early church had already been corrupted and Paul said, as many as corrupt the word of God, even in his day. Oregon, Morals and Dogma, page 544, born A.D. 134. So this is right there in the beginning. Answering Celsus, who had objected that the Christians had a concealed doctrine, said, Inasmuch as the essential and important doctrines and principles of Christianity are openly taught, it is foolish to object that there are other things that are recondite. In other words, they are not taught. For this is common to Christian discipline with that of those philosophers in whose teaching some things were exoteric for the outside world and some esoteric for the brilliant initiative initiated ones. And it is enough to say that it was so with some of the disciples of Pythagoras. So here he's talking about initiation, insiders being initiated. So Oregon believed in two doctrines, one for the outside, one for the inside. So he was an occultist. Morals and Dogma continues, Oregon gives much information as to the mysteries of the Ophites, and there is no doubt that all the Gnostic sects had mysteries and an initiation. So here was a secret doctrine that came into the churches. They all claimed to possess a secret doctrine coming to them directly from Jesus Christ, different from that of the Gospels and Epistles, and superior to these communications. So there was the insider who just knew a little bit more, and superior, which in their eyes were merely exoteric. So the Gospels are for the stupid people and the inside information is for the brilliant ones. Continue with morals and dogma to find out who these early apostate church fathers were that were rejected by the early church by the way. Uh, they were open to the fidelis, the fides, the faithful only. Remember that the Roman Catholic Church has this woman with a cup, mystery written on her head and the cup underneath it says Fides, which is also a dedication to a goddess, as we did in a previous lecture. Uh, Tertullian, there's one of the church fathers who died about AD 216, says in his apology, none are admitted to the religious mysteries without an oath of secrecy. We appeal to our Tracian and Eleusian mysteries and we are especially bound to this caution because if we prove faithless, we should not only provoke heaven but draw upon our heads the utmost rigor of human displeasure. And should strangers betray us? They knew nothing but report and hearsay. For hence ye profane, hence ye profane, is the prohibition from all holy mysteries. So, we are the profane. Get ye hence, you stupid ones. We are the initiated ones. We know. And there's another one. So that was Tertullian. He was a corrupt bishop. AD 216. We get it straight from the Masonic source. Then there was Clements, bishop of Alexandria. Well, we would expect an Alexandrian bishop to be corrupt. Born about AD 191. So there's an early bishop. Says in his Stromata that he cannot explain the mysteries because he should thereby, according to the old proverb, put a sword in the hands of a child. So now what have you been called so far? Profane? A child? Uninitiated? Ignorant? Well, yes, Cyril, Bishop of Jerusalem, was born in the year 315, died 386. This also comes from Morals and Dogma. In his catechesis, he says, The Lord spoke in parables to his hearers in general. But to his disciples he explained in private the parables and allegories which he spoke in public. The splendor of glory is for those who are early enlightened. So only those get the enlightenment. Obscurity and darkness are the portion of the unbelievers and the ignorant. Wow! Just so the church discovers its mysteries to those who have advanced beyond the class of catechumens. Here's another word for you, catechumens. I'm so proud I belong to the catechumens. We employ obscure terms with others. So, the dumb ones don't get the truth, only the initiated get the truth. Well, what does Matthew say about parables? 13 verse 35. 
that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. So the parables are to reveal, not to obscure. And they say the parables are to obscure and not to reveal. Now here's a famous uh, bishop, St. Augustine. As you all know, St. Augustine is the founding father, if you like, of Catholicism, who was born 347, died 430, says in one of his dis discourses, having dismissed the catechumens, hence ye catechumens, go away, we have retained you only to be our hearers. How nice, thank you for that privilege. Because besides those things which belong to all Christians in common, we are now to discourse to you of sublime mysteries, which none are qualified to hear, but those who by the Master's favor are made partakers of them. So Jesus will choose some for his favor, and the rest are catechumens. Go away. We'll just tell you what you think you should hear. To have taught them openly would have been to betray them. How nice. Isn't this deceptive? This is disgusting. St. Christostom and St. Augustine speaks of initiation more than 50 times. St. Ambrose wrote, writes to those who are initiated, and initiation was not merely baptism or admission into the church, but it referred to initiation into the mysteries. Morals and Dogma, page 4, 546. That's from the horse's mouth. You cannot get a better source than that. Then what does he say about Christ the Storm, Bishop of Constantinople? That's the other place where the corrupt uh, versions originated. He was born 354, died 417. He says, I wish to speak openly, but I dare not on account of those who are not initiated. Oh, brother, here's another one. So was the early church full of corrupt bishops already? Yes or no? Absolutely. I shall therefore avail myself of disguising terms, discoursing in a shadowy manner. Where the holy mysteries are celebrated, we drive away all uninitiated persons and then close the doors. These people do things in darkness. He mentions the acclamation of the initiated, which he says, I hear Passover in silence, for it is forbidden to th disclose such things to the profane. Your catechumens, your profane, your uninitiated, what are we still? Well, Karl Marx calls us cattle. Human herds. St. Cyril of Ag Alexandria, I like the way they always are saints. Saints of who? Who made bishop in 412 and died in 444, says in the seventh book against Julian, these mysteries are so profound and so exalted that they can be comprehended by those only who are enlightened. Aren't we fortunate that there are some enlightened ones on the world who know what's going on? The rest of us can just stay stupid. Well, what does the Bible say about these secret initiations? Isaiah 45, verse 19. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Wow, that sounds nice. I like that. Isaiah 48, 16. Come ye, ye near unto me. Hear ye this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, there I am, and now the Lord God and His Spirit has sent me. No secrets with God. Amos 3 verse 7, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but He reveals His secret unto the servants, the prophets. Mark 4 verse 22, let's go to the New Testament. For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. Luke 8, verse 17, For nothing is secret, there shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Luke eleven thirty three: No man, when he hath lighted a candle, put it in a secret place, neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick, that they which come in may see the light. John 7, verse 4, For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, 
and he himself seeketh to be known openly, if thou do these things, show thyself to the world. Which doctrine do you prefer? Those of the enlightened, enlightened initiated ones, or those of the Bible? Which God would you prefer to serve? The God of the initiated ones, or the God of the Bible? I like this one. I like Jesus Christ. Let me tell you what Jesus said. John 18, verse 20. Jesus answered him and sp him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort. And in secret, I have said nothing. Which God do you prefer? I prefer this one. I hate the secrecy, this clandestine religion, this I know more than you story. Isn't it disgusting? I know the path and I don't care if you don't make it, you're just a catechumen. Well, let's have a look how they changed it, these initiated ones, to keep the truth away from the rest of the world. Which verses did they change? We know they changed them. Let's just have a few easy ones. And then we'll get deeper and deeper into the doctrine. Remember a few things. Remember that Hort said, we will change it very slightly. Here a word, there a word, and nobody will even notice. And finally, when we have it all together, when we have all the little changes in one big package, if you read it all together, our doctrine, and not theirs, will be there. Isn't that what he said? That's exactly what he said. So, NIV, 2 Samuel 21, 19. In another battle with the Philistines at Gob, Elahin, son of Yarekum, the Bethlehem, the might, killed Goliath, the Gittite, who had a spear with a shaft like a weaver's rod. Oops, who killed him? Elahin, son of Yare Oregim. King James. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines where Elanan, the son of, same one, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Who did kill Goliath? Oh, so you prefer the King James version over the other one? Over the NIV? 2 Samuel 23 verse 5, NIV. Is not my house right with God? King James Version, although my house be not so with God. So they turn everything around. When God says it's not right, the NIV says it is right. Another one. Hosea 11.12, and Judah is unruly against God, even against the faithful Holy One. King James, but Judah yet ruleth with God, and is faithful with the saints. You see, God had said, Ephraim has left me, Israel has left me, but Judah is still with me. Satan doesn't like that, so he says, no, all of them were against me. So he changed that too. There's a little change. It's, you know, it's minor, but it, it's quite important. You're either with God or you're against God. Matthew 5, 44, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who per persecute you. Revised Standard Version. King James Version. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Well, let's just take that out, and then uh, we don't have a full story anymore. Matthew 18, verse 11. Don't you think this is an important text? For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Don't you think that is an important text? I think it's a very important text. Why is, it, why is it gone in the Revised Standard Version? Because Jesus is not supposed to be the only Savior. You say, we're supposed to save ourselves. Didn't Masonry teach that we can save ourselves? We don't need Jesus. That's a ridiculous teaching. It's just an example. Matthew 20, 16, the Revised Standard Version. So the last will be first and the first will be last. Nice. And the King James? So the last shall be first and the first shall be last, for many are called, but few are chosen. You see, here it makes a difference. Here it is important to choose, to choose right. Here 
You just come first to last, who cares? But here, you could be last if you don't make the right choice. Which one do you think is the correct one? So, away with the choice business. Matthew chapter 20, verses 22 and 23. Well, the NIV says, you don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Nice. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those whom they have been prepared for by my Father. What does the King James say? Jesus answered and said, you know not what you ask, you are able to drink, are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? And to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Can you be baptized with the baptism that I am to be baptized with? Can you go through the same? Can you go through suffering for my sake? Matthew twenty-five thirteen. Very important, RSV. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Now tell me, is that a logical text for the God of the universe to put into the Bible? To say, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Of what? Hello? Of what? Wherein the Son of Man cometh. Doesn't that make sense? So which one is even the more logical one? Obviously this one. So now please note that in this one you know neither the day nor the hour of when the ice cream man will come along or whatever. But in this one, it's important, wherein the Son of Man cometh. Now let's go a little bit further. Notice what the NIV does in Matthew 24, 36. No one knows about that day that we just read about, or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Have you read that? Have you read that text? Nor the Son? What does the King James Version say? But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Where is the, nor the Son bit? It's not there. Now if you take the verse where Jesus says, I and the Father are one, then what does that make of this verse? Does Jesus then know when he's coming, yes or no? Absolutely. But what does it imply? if you put there, nor the Son. It implies that Jesus is not part of the Godhood. Are you with me? It implies that Jesus is not part of the Godhood. This is a serious change. Mark chapter 2, verse 17. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. How nice. Hello, sinners. Here you come to me. This is great. The NIV. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. King James. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners, to repentance. Wow. Here there's an action. This is ecumenical. Let's all have a party together. It doesn't matter whether you believe the same thing, whether you keep the Ten Commandments, whatever you do, if you believe that you can, you know, sleep around with 50 women at the same time, who cares? No, no, no. The King James says, to repentance. So, take it up. We don't need that. We are initiated ones. We are above that. Mark chapter 6, verse 11. Now please note, I'm going through the smaller changes so that you can see the big picture at the end of the time. I'm not even going through the mega changes. I'm just going through the subtle changes where a little bit is changed here and a little bit is changed there. Mark 6, verse 11. If any place, if any place will not receive you and they refuse to hear you when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet for a testimony against them. What's, what does the King James say? And whosoever shall not receive you nor hear you, when you depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Why do you think that verse has been removed? Why do they remove the verse which says it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah? Because they do not believe in a judgment. You see, the choice that you make 
Who cares? Didn't they believe in reincarnation? Whatever you did wrong now, who cares? You can fix it next time round. And even if you can't fix it next time round, in purgatory, you can burn it off. That's fine. So, let's take the judgment right out. That will solve the problem. Then we've modified that text. Can you see how many pieces are missing? So, I'm not talking about whole verses here. We're just looking at half verses and these things. Mark 10, verse 21. Revised Standard Version. And come follow me, NIV. Then come follow me, ASV. Come follow me, King James. And come take up the cross and follow me. What's the difference between those two? There is a cross to bear. When you become a Christian, there is a change in life, and there is a cross to bear. And that is Christianity. The other is what? Salvation in sin, one big happy party. Mark 10, verse 21. Why would they take that out? Isn't it incredible? Just take it out. Why not? Mark 10, verse 24, RSV. Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. The NIV. How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Wow, even worse. King James Version. Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. What's the difference between those two? Well, here, you might as well give up from the beginning and rather reincarnate a couple of times. Here, better not get rich. Better give all your money away. Here, money is not the problem. It's making an idol of money that's a problem. Isn't that correct? You can be rich, but you can do a lot of good for the Lord God. You can do a lot of good. So this one is the only one that makes any sense. This one is just discouragement. My God is a God of encouragement, not discouragement. Take it out. We don't need that. We need arms, after all. If you have to keep uh, the monasteries and the nunneries going, you better take that verse out. Mark 13, verse 14. But when you see the desolated sacrilege set up where it ought not to be. Well... This is fascinating. But when you see the abomination, this is King James, of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not to be. Why take that out? Because Jesus is pointing to two specific apocalyptic books in the Bible where we should study for the end times. The one is the book of Daniel and the other one is the book of Revelation. Blessed are they that Read the words of this book, it says, in terms of Revelation. And it says, when you see this spoken of by the prophet Daniel, go and look over there. You'll find some answers there. Because they were asked, what is the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Check it out in the book of Daniel, Jesus said. Well, let's take away the evidence. Just remove it. They don't like that prophecy. Luke chapter 2 verse 14, Revised Standard Version. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace amongst men with whom he is pleased. King James, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Now what's the difference between those two? It's a very subtle change, but what is the change? Here yeah, there's an initiated few with whom he is pleased. There, God is for everyone, not two classes. This is for the initiated insider, this is for the catechumens included, cannot be changed. See what I mean? It's disgusting. It's really disgusting what they're doing here. Luke chapter 4 verse 4. And it's not in harmony with the character of God. That's the important principle. So it's not a question of grammar. It's a question of principle. Luke chapter 4 verse 4. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Revised Standard Version. NIV. Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live by bread alone. Is that right? King James Version. And Jesus answered him saying, it is written, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Oops. 
We're changing it all, so we better remove that or else we rebuke ourselves, right? So, let's just take it out. The word is not important today. The word is just merely incidental. What is important is what you feel. What you feel is right. God will lead you through his spirit. All religions lead to the ultimate source. Trust your feelings. Forget about the word. Isn't that the teaching of the world today? Isn't that what they teach? But if you trust every word of God, you better make sure that you know what God wants and make the necessary changes. 2 Timothy 3.16, the ASV. Every scripture inspired of God is also profitable for teaching. King James Version, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. They changed one little word. What's the difference? One little word. We will change, said Hort, a little bit here, a little bit there, and they won't even notice it. Now, after all, catechumens, they're so stupid, they won't notice. What is this? Here, only that scripture which is inspired by God is profitable. So which is inspired and which is not? Well, that's for the initiator to decide, isn't it? That's why the Pope will tell you what to believe and you can't just read for yourself because then you are heresis. You make your own choice and that is heresy. You're subject to the penalty of death. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Luke chapter 9, verse 55 and 56. Just look what disappears. RSV. But he turned and rebuked them and they went into another village. The NIV. But Jesus turned and rebuked them and they went into another village. You know, besides being strange, it's, it's a stupid verse. It's stupid. But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went into another village. Now, which one to you makes more sense? Which one is important? Which one is more important to you? This one has power. This one has a savior. This one has an answer to all your troubles. This one has no answer whatsoever. It might as well not be in the Bible. And I don't believe God ever put something so ridiculous as that in the Bible. Luke chapter 22, verse 43 and 44. Gone. You won't find it in the RSV. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground. Why do you think they removed that text? Remember, they don't believe in the atonement. And if they don't believe in the atonement, they don't believe that Jesus shed one drop of blood for you. <laughs> Away with that disgusting doctrine of the atonement, as Hort claims. These are serious changes. And the Lord says that people who touch his word like this and remove Jesus Christ from the gospel, are going to have to pay the price. John chapter 14 10 verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. King James Version. This is subtle. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. There's a subtle difference there. All right. In view of the next succeeding words, as the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, this change destroys the exquisite diversity of expression of the original. It makes grammatical sense and it gives the relationship between father and son, which means that Jesus is God. It's a subtle change to remove some of the power of Jesus Christ. Acts 8, Acts 28, verse 29. Let it be known to you then that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning amongst themselves, says the King James. Now why does the book of Acts have to have that removed in the RSV? I'll tell you why. Because when you decide for or against the subject, it's going to be divisive. It's going to be divisive. And they 
had great reasoning amongst themselves. But a spirit of ecumenism says, everybody come together, we are one happy family. Here, there is a spirit of separation. Do you understand the difference? Very important difference. So Jesus makes a difference. And it's important that we know what the Bible teaches on this issue. In our previous session we saw that the gospel is divisive. So when you preach Jesus Christ, a decision is made. The gospel is a two-edged sword which strikes and cuts through to the marrow. And people make a decision based on the facts. And they either move to the one camp or the other camp. So that is why verse 29 in an ecumenical Bible had to go. Because great reasoning and a split came between them. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 28. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then out of consideration for the man who informed you, and for conscience sake, etc. King James Version. But if any may say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So why are there certain rules in the Bible? Because God owns it. And who owns it here? The Lord. That's a reference to Jesus Christ. So, ooh, we don't want him to own it because the esoterics, remember, masonry has someone else as their deity. So where Jesus is depicted as Lord of this earth, those verses are systematically eradicated from the Bible. Revelation 14 verse 5. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are spotless. NIV, no lie was found in their mouth, they are blameless. King James. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. You see, here is a, an accountability towards a higher power. Here, there is no accountability. There could be an accountability to yourself. It means nothing. Here, it is important who rules. Revelation 22 verse 14 is a radical change. Blessed are those who wash their robes. I hope they use the right soap powder. I don't know what brands you have here, but maybe it makes a difference. Revelation 22 verse 14 says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life. Now which one do you think is probably right? Here there's no accountability. And uh, what are you washing your robes with? What are you rush washing your robes with? Blessed are they that do his commandments. That's obedience. Let's change that. In the RSV, in the NIV, in the ASV, let's get rid of it. Luke chapter 4, verse 8. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Well, the Douay, which is basically the Jesuit Bible, or the product of the Jesuit Bible, and Jesus answered and said to him, It is written, Thou shalt adore the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. What's gone? Something's gone. RSV, same thing. And Jesus answered, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. The NIV, Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God, and serve him only. All of them leave something out. What do they leave out? Get ye behind me, Satan. Now why? Why do they leave that out? The expression, Get ye behind me, Satan, was early omitted because Jesus used the same expression later to Peter in Matthew 16.23 to rebuke the apostle. And we wouldn't want the same spirit to be confused here. And this has to do with the doctrine of Peter becoming eventually a pope. It's quite a complex issue, but uh, there's a good reason why they took it out. Acts 13, verse 42. Sabbath. Now notice this subtle little change. This is very important for those 
who keep the seventh day Sabbath. King James. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now remember that this is all based on Greek documents. The words are there. These are changes that were made by these individuals for a purpose. The Jewe, which was again this one based on the Jesuit Bible, and as they, as they went out, they desired them that on the next Sabbath they would speak unto them these words. The RSV does the same thing. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told to them the next Sabbath. The NIV says, as Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. You see, in the King James, it says, and when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue. What does that mean? It means that he was preaching to the Jews. And then the Gentiles came and said, will you preach this to us next Sabbath? That means that the Gentiles were willing to come on the Sabbath. Now, if you take the Jews out there, then it's not Saturday necessarily. If it's just they, it could be an ecumenical meeting, and Sabbath could then be any day. But linking it to the Jews, which day would it definitely be? Saturday. It would definitely be Saturday. So a subtle little change. These guys are so thorough. Do you think this is a slip of the pen? I don't think so. Now this one gets even worse. Very slight change, but very succinct. Acts 16, verse 7. After they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. The Jewe, and when they come to Mysia, da 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 da, and the Spirit of Jesus suffered them not. The RSV does the same thing, the Spirit of Jesus, and the NIV does the same thing, the Spirit of Jesus. Now, why? You see, you have to understand the occult mind to understand this one. What happens here is, the Spirit, that's the Spirit of God, tells them no. Here, it is now the Spirit of Jesus, which implies that the Spirit is in control of Jesus. Are you with me? The New Age teaches that when Jesus was one of the initiated masters that came to this earth, he didn't have power to do it right, so he was overshadowed by Matreya, who used him like a puppet. That's what they teach. Here, the same idea comes up. Jesus is controlled by the Spirit, and the Spirit tells them what to do. Here, the implication is, the Spirit says no, and if Jesus is the one who said no, then he and the Spirit are one. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. The Jewe, for Christ our Pash is sacrificed. The RSV, for Christ our Pash our Lamb has been sacrificed. The NIV, for Christ our Passover Lamb has been sacrificed. Big deal. What's gone? For us. You see, the exclusivity of Jesus has to go. Sad state of affairs. The phrase, through his blood, is not found in either the Jesuit or American Revised Version. Its omission can be traced to Oregon, 200 AD, who expressly denies that either the body or soul of our Lord was offered as the price of our redemption. Now you must understand something here. The occultists teach that Jesus never really died for you. The occultists teach that Jesus had a esoteric body. He didn't come in the flesh. Now the Bible teaches that he who says that Jesus didn't come in the flesh is antichrist. The occultists teach that when he hung on the cross he just appeared to hang there for the Jews and that God whisked him away before he died so he never died a vicarious death for you. Do you understand the difference? So here we have the same idea. He was not sacrificed for us, 
because esoterically he never died for you. Because you don't need a savior, you save yourself. You are God. This is arrogance of the highest degree. The power of God is denied. 1 Peter 1.22 seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. The RSV says, having purified your souls by your obedience, your obedience to the truth for a sincere love of the brethren for one another, blah, blah, blah. NIV, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. You see, here the obedience is something that you have achieved through purification of yourself. Here, the obedience that you have achieved has been made possible through the indwelling power of whom? Of God, through the Spirit. Which one would you prefer to be correct here? Never mind what you prefer. What do they change? Here, it is not God, it is not Christ in you that is working a change. It is your own power. This is occult, and that is biblical. 2 Timothy 4 verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, at his appearing. Now this is a very important little change. Wow, one little word. By, at, one tiny little, oh, what difference does it make? It makes the world of difference. At his appearing in his kingdom, I charge thee before God and Jesus Christ, says the Jew, who shall judge the living and the dead, by his coming in his kingdom. RSV says the same, by, NIV says, in view of. Hello? What does that imply? This implies that the judgment takes place when? When Jesus comes back. Jesus is going to come back. What does the other one imply? Implies something totally different. Let's see. The King James in this text fixes the great day of judgment as occurring at the time of his appearing and his kingdom. The Jesuit and the revised versions and the NIV and the, all of the others place it in the indefinite future. Anyway, it could happen at any time. In fact, Roman Catholicism teaches a millennialism. There is no millennium. The church reigns as the kingdom. Important point, which is also not biblical, of course. So these things have to be changed to bring it in line with Roman Catholic thinking. Hebrews 7.21, King James. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath, by him that says unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Okay, so Jesus was a priest of a different order, of a higher order, because only Levites were allowed to be priests, but Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. And as a someone from the pride of tribe of Judah, how could he be a priest? But he was of a higher order, of the order of Melchizedek, who was king of Salem. Now, what's the Jew I do? Thou art priest forever. Well, where's the rest? What does the RSV do? Thou art priest forever. What does the NIV do? You are a priest forever. After the order of Melchizedek is gone, so Jesus hasn't got a higher priesthood? Isn't that interesting? Did you know that the Freemasons, when they are initiated, are of the order of Melchizedek? Did you know that a Mormon, is in, when he is initiated into the higher degrees, is of the order of Melchizedek? So he stands higher than Jesus? That's fascinating. Okay, so let's make Jesus a little bit less than what he should be. John 5 verse 39, Search the scriptures, for in, the, in them you have eternal life. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. The NIV, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. What's the difference between them? Here it is a command. Search the scriptures. Semicolon. For in them you think you have eternal life. Here, it is they who are, have the initiate. On this point, the Dublin Review, notice this, this is a Catholic newspaper 
or a Catholic article, July 1881, says the following. But perhaps the most surprising change of all is John 5, 39. That's the one we just read. It is no longer search the scriptures, but ye search. And thus Protestantism has lost the very cause of its being. So they knew what they were doing and why they changed it. Because we believe that you have to search the scriptures to find eternal life. And here, Protestantism is scrapped. Because just they believe. A deadly blow against miracles, John 2.11. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee. RSV, signs. NIV, miraculous signs. Not miracles anymore. Jesus, what Jesus did was a miracle. It's something that no one else could do. Jesus was special. He was different to anyone. He was not a magician. The word miracle is found singular and plural 32 times in the authorized version of the New Testament. Alas, what desolation has been wrought by the revised. In 23 of these instances, the word miracle has entirely disappeared. In the case of the other nine, although the term is used in the text, its force is robbed by a weakening substitute in the margin. Our authorized Bible vindicated by Professor Wilkinson. Doctrine of conversion. Notice how this is undermined in Matthew 18, 2 and 3. And Jesus said, except ye be converted and become as little children. And he said, unless you turn and become like little children. Turn to what? NIV, unless you change and become like little children. Change how? Conversion is a very strong term and implies exactly what it means. Remove it. Let's go a little deeper. Human knowledge exalted above the divine word of the, by the revision. Without him, says John 1, 3 and 4, was not anything made that was made in him was life. The RSV puts in the margin, without him was not anything made that which has been made was life in him. Now these are subtle little changes. Now let's just check out how it goes further. No creation, evolution instead. Hebrews 11 verse 3. King James. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. The RSV says in the margin, By faith we understand that the ages have been framed by the word of God. Now it's ages. Okay. The NIV does this. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. Now you will say, you know, I really don't get it. It doesn't look like such a big deal. Here it's the worlds, there it's the universe. You know, what's the big deal? Well, let's go and find out what Professor Hort had in mind when he suggested this change. Let's ask him. It's nice to go to the horse's mouth. Well, Professor Hort, on Westcott, what did you say? Westcott writes, in this connection we see the full meaning of the words used of creation in Hebrews 11.3. By faith we understand that the worlds, the ages, the universe, there's the NIV word, under the aspect of time, have been formed by the word of God. The whole sequence of life and time, which we call the world, has been fitted together by God. His one creative word included harmonious unfolding on one plan of the last issues of all that was made. That which is in relation to him, one act at once, is in relation to us. Oh, they write so nauseatingly, but let me continue. Evolution apprehended in orderly succession. See, what did he believe in? He believed in evolution. And if you believe in evolution, then you have to change the word just so subtly so that you don't get the import of the first version. Colossians 1, 15 and 16 who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created. That's pretty clear. No doubt, right? Jesus did it. RSV, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation, for in him all things were created. Well, if we're all divine, could be in us too, right? The new language of the revised and the judgment of the revisers hinders the application of these texts to a material creation, as in the King James, and limits them as a spiritual application to Christianity. So there we go. 
let's just change the whole doctrine of creation. King James, Hebrews 1 verse 2, By him also he made the worlds. RSV, through him also he made the ages. NIV, through whom he made the universe. Now it's possible to spiritualize creation. Subtle, subtle changes. Ephesians 3 verse 9 really irritates me. The NIV says, And to make plain to everyone the administration of his, this mystery which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. What do you think the King James says? Well, let's read it. Who created all things by Jesus Christ. Away with Jesus Christ. Don't you think there's a subtle attack on Jesus Christ here? Or maybe not such a subtle attack, right? Maybe it's a pretty blatant attack on Jesus Christ. But the Spirit suffered them not. We've had that already, the Spirit of Jesus in the margin. The Jewe is like the revised on this change. Milligan says, Acts 16.7, the striking reading of the Spirit of Jesus not simply as in the authorized version, this spirit implies that the Holy Spirit had so taken possession of the person of the exalted Jesus that he could be spoken of as the spirit of Jesus. So this is the exposition, this is what the experts say, so that's exactly the change that they wanted. Now, remember that Hort denied the atonement. They hated the doctrine that Jesus Christ died for you by the shedding of his blood. Colossians 1.14 King James, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. The Jesuit version, in whom we have redemption, the remission of sins. What's gone? Through his blood. Well, what's the RSV say? In him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Strange. And the NIV, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That's the Jesuit Bible. So basically, if you read the NIV, you're reading the Jesuit Bible. Through his blood, gone. Change in the doctrine. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. We've had this text, but I just want to show it to you again. There it is. The for us is removed in the RSV, and it's removed in the NIV. So, no difference. One writer thus registers his indignation upon the change made in this passage. He writes, here's Reverend Burke's and Dr. Warfield's collection of opinions. Mad! Yes, I'm mad, he says. Yes, and haven't I reason to be mad when I find that grand old passage for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us, a passage which sounds the keynote of the whole doctrine of redemption, unnecessarily changed into for our Passover, also has been sacrificed, even Christ. And we have such changes everywhere. They are, I believe, called improvements in style by their authors and certainly by no one else. I like his style. This guy's got got so. Yes, I agree with you, 100%. What about the set doctrine of the second coming of Christ? Wouldn't it be interesting if they could change that as well? Matthew 24, verse 3, King James. What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? RSV in the margin. What shall be the sign of thy presence and of the consummation of the age? Okay. So Jesus doesn't have to come with the clouds. He can just sort of you know, sneak around, appear here, appear there. If you hear he's here, if you hear he's there, don't go. You know the story. Let's go on. Philippians 3, 20, 21. King James. Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body? The RSV and the ASV uh, say. Who shall fashion anew the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of his glory? Now what's the difference between those two? Why do they go to so much trouble to make those changes? Well, let's ask them. The change in us, indicated by the King James, according to this and other scriptures, is a change that occurs only at the second coming of Christ. It is a physical change of tangible reality, but the change called for by the revised may occur at any time before his coming, or be continuous as you are changing, as you become a 
more accustomed to Christianity. It may be a change from the abstract vices to abstract virtues. See, they've spiritualized the way, the coming of Christ. He comes in glory and you are changed instantly. That's what the Bible teaches. They don't like that. They prefer reincarnation. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 2. Here's an interesting one. That you be not soon shaken in mind as that day of Christ is at hand. That at hand means soon to come. Revised, now present. Aha! Uh -huh. This implies that it could actually be right there. Now, has already come, says the NIV. So, here again, subtle changes changing the story of the second coming. Titus 2 verse 13, King James. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Awaiting RSV, awaiting our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and the Savior Jesus Christ. You notice the subtle change? By changing the adjective glorious to the name noun glory, the revisers have removed the second coming of Christ from the text. Now, it's not he that comes, it is something that could happen at any time. Revelation 1.7 he cometh with the clouds, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Notice this change. King James Version. Because of him. The revised. He is coming with the clouds, and all the tribes of earth shall mourn over him. Now, what does it mean? Remember that Hort said, we'll change it here a little bit, we'll change it there a little bit. Bishop Westcott himself states, all the tribes of the earth shall mourn over him in penitential sorrow, and not as the authorized version shall wail because of him in the present expectation of terrible vengeance. Aha! So now when Jesus comes, according to this one, they will all say, we're sorry for what we did, and he'll say, fine, my children, come, you are all saved. Whereas in the previous one, there was a judgment at the flood, and there will be a judgment at the end. Isn't that what the Bible teaches? Yes or no? Aha, uh -huh. it's gone. It's spiritualized away. You have another chance, you know, again, burn it off on the other side or reincarnate again or whatever. Dr. Alexander Roberts, a member of the English New Testament Committee, is of course for the change. What does he say? Acts 3, 19 and 20, an impossible translation here occurs in the authorized version which implies that Jesus will come to judge the world. No, we don't want that, he says. Repent ye therefore, and then he reads it again. And he says, for eschatological reasons, it is most important that the true rendering of this passage should be presented. It is thus given in the revised version. So, we've changed it, so that there is no judgment when Jesus comes. Nice, thank you. Most of the revisers did not believe there would be a personal return of Jesus before the restitution of all things, which the authorized rendering of this passage teaches. So there's a whole change of doctrine here. This is very important if you believe in the advent of Christ and what's going to happen. Mark chapter 7 verse 19, because it entereth not in the hearts but into the belly. Notice this change. This is so vile, this change. So sneaky. Because it entereth not into his heart but into the belly and goeth out in the draught. That means when you go to the toilet. Purging all meats, foods. So, basically the King James says it doesn't go into the heart, it goes into the stomach, and it goes out, and then it's gone. The RSV says, since it enters not in his heart, but his stomach, and so passes on, thus he declared all foods clean. Hello? Where does he declare foods clean in this one? Nowhere. Now let's read what the NIV says. It gets even more blatant. Oh boy, this is some change. For it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach, and then out of his body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. Where does it say that? It doesn't say it anywhere. So we've got a whole new doctrine here. Okay, interesting. So for those who really love the NIV, you'll have a hard time proving some interesting facts. Luke 23, 44 and 45, King James. And it was about the sixth hour and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour and the sun was darkened. So that was a miracle, showing that Jesus was the Son of God and here was a celestial miracle. 
RSV says the sun's light failed. And the Moffat translation says owing to an eclipse of the sun. I wonder where they get that from. So no miracle over here. 1 Corinthians 7 5 leaves out that you have to fast sometimes or that fasting might be beneficial. John 9 verse 4, one little word changed. Notice this, how cute they are. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. The RSV and the NIV says, we must work the works of him who sent me. What's the difference between the two? It's a massive difference. In the one, Jesus is the only one who can do this work. Here we can all do it. I will show you modern day preachers in lectures to come that stand up on the pulpit and say they could have saved you just like Jesus could. I'll show you preachers, high ranking preachers in the world who say that exact thing. And well, no problem, you can use this text in the new reversions to do that. One little change. Here. 2 Timothy 4.1 I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing. Very important again. And by his appearing. That same change where the doctrine of the coming of Christ is changed. 1 Corinthians 11.9 Now here you have the whole question of transubstantiation, the whole mass story coming up. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. RSV, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment upon himself. The unworthy is gone and the Lord is gone. The NIV, for anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment upon himself. Wow, this, this is Roman Catholicism. This is a host. Here you have transubstantiation. The omission of unworthy and Lord therefore condemns Protestants who do not believe that the bread has been turned into the body of Christ. This is a Jesuit Bible. The NIV is a Jesuit Bible, make no doubt. I used to read it, and I still have it on my shelf, but I like to use it to show people the changes. So don't throw them away, keep them. Make a whole series of them. Now what about the restoring the confessional? Roman Catholicism teaches the confessional. King James says, confess your faults one to another. The RSV, therefore confess your sins one to another. The NIV, therefore confess your sins to each other. The Dublin Review, this is a Catholic newspaper, July 1881 says, the apostles have now power to forgive sins and not simply to remit them. Confess your sins is the new reading of James 5.16. So was it deliberate, yes or no? It was deliberate. It was very deliberate. So they can get the confessional into the NIV. Hebrews 10.21, King James, and having a high priest over the house of God, and high priest. RSV, a great priest. NIV, a great priest. Okay? That means it implies that there can be other priests. If there is a great priest, it implies there can be priests that are not so great, also officiating, but and priest is one priest. So now you can have a priesthood, very important. And this is a bomber. I want you all to take note of this text. Everyone sitting here. This text is very important for you, and it's incredibly important for me. The whole church government is changed in Acts 15, verse 23. The King James. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren sent greetings unto the brethren. Okay? Who sends these greetings and this information? The apostles, the elders, and the brethren send out the first apostolic letter to the churches. The RSV. With the following letter, the brethren, both the apostles and elders, to the brethren who are of the Gentiles. 
the NIV. With them they sent following letter, the apostles and elders, comma, your brothers, to the Gentile believers. What does this do? This is very important. All they've changed is basically a comma. That's all they've done. It's a very subtle change. But it's a mighty, 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 mighty change. And I'll tell you why. Because here you have three groups officiating in the church. You have the apostles, you have the elders, and you have the brethren. And Peter says, you are all priests. Does Peter say that? Yes or no? You are all priests. That's what Peter says. Here, you have two groups. You have the apostles and the elders, and then you have the brethren. Now, what did they think about this? Here we go. This passage is used as a foundation on which to base an argument for a clergy separated by God in their function from the lay brethren. It makes a vast difference in sending out this authoritative letter from the first council of the Christian church, whether it issued from the apostles and elders only, or whether it issued from the apostles, elders, and the brethren. Here again, to effect this change, the revisers omitted two Greek words. So they changed it by leaving out two Greek words. And now they have the apostles and the elders, and then they have the brethren. Have you heard people say, you should not be preaching this, you're not a theologian? Have you heard that? What right have you to stand and preach the word of God, you are not a theologian? I'll tell you, I have heard that many, many times in my life. I'm not a theologian. No, I'm a brethren. And so are all of you, brethren. And you have the right to preach the word of God because you are priests of the Most High. To change it, you are, have no right to preach, you are not a theologian, is Jesuit teaching. It's from the pits of hell. It's not biblical. And everybody is a priest of God. So ignore them when they say you're not a theologian. You have the right to read the word of God just as they have the right to read the word of God. Very important changes and they irritate me. This name then of priest and priesthood properly so called as St. Augustine said, here we go back to the church fathers, which is an order distinct from the laity and vulgar people ordained to offer Christ in an unbloody manner in the sacrifice to his heavenly father for us to preach and minister the sacraments and to be the pastors of the people they wholly suppress in their translations. See the point? Augustine says, we are holy priesthood and you are just profane rubbish. We'll tell you what to believe. No, no, no. The Bible says no such thing. And that early letter, very important. Hebrews 9, verse 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. That's pretty clear. RSV. And just as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. NIV, to die once and after this to face judgment. Now let's ask these people what the change meant. Canon Farrar claims the change was deliberate. And Canon Farrar ought to know because he was a member of the Apostles Club. Remember that club that Hort belonged to, that secret society? Farrar said in this change, there is a positive certainty that it does not mean the judgment in the sense in which that word is popularly understood by abandoning the article which King James translators here incorrectly inserted. The revisers help, as they have done in so many other places, silently to remove deep-seated errors. Well, you're an apostle up there, but an apostle of another kind, I believe. At the death of each of us, there follows a judgment. As the sacred writer says, the judgment, the final judgment, may not be for centuries to come in the omission of that unauthorized little article from the authorized version by the revisers no, lies no less a doctrine than that of the existence of an intermediate state. Aha! So by leaving out the little article, you've got purgatory in your Bible. You can prove purgatory, but you cannot prove it is once to die, and then the judgment. Luke one seventy two, To perform the mercy promised to our fathers, revised, and the NIV, to show mercy to our fathers. Now this is interesting. 
This is fascinating. Now you can show mercy to our fathers so I can pray for the dead. Can I now pray for the dead? Apparently, yes. The text was one which, if rendered literally, no one could read without being convinced that at least sus suspected that the fathers already dead needed mercy and that the Lord God of Israel was prepared to perform it to them. But where were those fathers? Not in heaven, where mercy is swallowed up in joy, and assuredly not in hell, of the damned, where mercy could not reach them. They must therefore have been in a place between both, or neither the one nor the other. What, in limbo or purgatory? Why, certainly, in one or the other. So now we have purgatory in the Bible. Did you know that it was there? If you have a modern translation, you can prove purgatory. Tremendous. The bishop further claims that the revisers in making this change vindicated the Jesuit New Testament of 1582 and convicted the King James of perversion. Right, Jesuit Bible. 1 Peter 4 verse 6. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. RSV. For this is why the gospel was preached even to the dead. NIV gets even worse. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead. Now, what does that mean? Well, here, the gospel, was it preached to those who are dead? Sure. In the past, the gospel was preached to those that are dead now. Here, it is still being preached to the dead. Acts 24 verse 15, And there shall be a resurrection of the dead. But the RSV says, there will be a resurrection for both the just and the unjust. Ah, so when you are dead, you are dead, and then you will rise, according to the King James, but not according to the others. Now you can be a ghost. So let's see if we can find ghost theology. Job 19 verse 26. The NASV says, Even after my flesh is flayed, yet without my flesh I shall see God. So how do you see God now? As a spook. Casper the friendly ghost. That's how you will see him. What does the King James say? And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. That's a big difference. The one is a resurrection, the other one is not. Job 26.5 Dead things are formed under the waters and the inhabitants thereof. The revised. They, the shades margin, they are deceased, tremble beneath the waters and the inhabitants thereof. Ooh, this is fascinating. This is complicated stuff. And the first one over here, dead things are formed from under the waters and the inhabitants thereof. So, dead things are down there. The revised, now the deceased tremble underneath the waters. So there's something like hell or purgatory or something. The NIV, it gets more blatant. The dead are in deep anguish, those beneath the waters and all that live in them. Wow! So now we have somebody burning down there in purgatory. So the NIV, again, teaches a totally unbiblical doctrine. King James, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Look what the NIV says unrighteously for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. What have we got here? You know, these Bibles are disgusting as far as I'm concerned. They are disgusting. They are teaching a totally different doctrine here. The different regions of conscious dead as Roman Catholics teach supported by the revised. King James, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book, referring to the beast, now that is, of the Lamb, slain from the foundations of the world. Here the Lamb was slain, slain from the foundations of the world. The RSV. And all that dwell on earth will worship it, everyone whose names have not been written before the foundations of the world. Here it's the people whose names have been written before the foundations in the book of life of the Lamb. The King James in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, 4 says, He rose again on the third day. The Revised said, He hath been raised on the third day. What's the difference between the two? The difference is in the one, He has power within Himself to rise from the dead, and in the other one, He gets raised because He's inferior to God. That's the difference. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four. Very interesting, the Mass. 
He broke it and he said, take it, this is my body which is broken, the RSV. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. Now we have a host. We have a literal body. So this is Catholic doctrine, that is not. Christ is with us always, not in person, but by his spirit. The revisor's doctrine of the incarnation, the mass therefore makes unnecessary and destroys the truth that he shall come to the second time without sin unto salvation. Hebrews 9, 28. Cardinal Wiseman exalts that the revision movement vindicated the Catholic Bible. Look what he says. When we consider the scorn cast by the reformers upon the Vulgate and their a recurrence in consequence to the Greek as the only accurate standard, we cannot but rejoice at the silent triumph which truth has at length gained over the clamorous error. For in fact, the principal writers who have avenged the Vulgate and obtained for it its critical preeminence are Protestants. Wow. I wonder whether they were Protestants. I think they were Jesuits disguised as Protestants because that's what we saw in the previous lecture. And we have similar statements here from the Reverend Thomas. The brief examination which I've been able to make of the revised version of the New Testament has convinced me that the committee have labored with great sincerity and diligence and that they have produced a translation much more correct than generally received amongst the Protestants. So he says, it is in line with the Catholic version and confirms the correctness of our Bible. There we go, so all these changes have been made. Catholic magazine claims the revised version is the death knell of Protestantism. Protestantism is going to go. The destruction of their temple that Shekinah departed from the Holy of Holies. So perhaps it is to be with the English Bible, the temple of Protestantism. It's going to be destroyed. It's going to go. The Revitas had a wonderful opportunity. They might have made a few changes, says the Protestant journal, but they blew it. They destroyed it. One question I have for you. Is Jesus a liar? King James Version. John 7 verse 8, Go ye up into the feast. I go not up yet unto the feast, for my time is not yet full come. RSV, go to the feast yourselves. I'm not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. Here Jesus says, I'm not going, but he went. Here Jesus says, I'm not yet going, and then he went. So here he's telling the truth, and there's a liar. You choose whether you want Jesus to be a liar, or whether you don't want to him to be a liar. The greatest damage of all is when you take away the deity of Christ. And for that, we will wait for the next session. Thank you.